The accessories on the rider for this sculpture, taking the bull with the bow, are also miniatures. Alan will show you step by step how he created the buffalo skull, bow and arrows, sharps carbine, knife and sheath, and quiver with bow case. I've been making these miniatures for a lot of years, developing the Ekman method. here at Ekman Fine Art and I want to teach you how to make these. I use this sculpture taking the bull with the bow as a reason for doing this. The warrior has a knife and sheath at his side, sharp carving strapped to his back quiver and bow case, bow and arrow, while there is a buffalo skull on the ground lying in the grass. Let's start with this buffalo skull. This is a starter cast of one of my buffalo skulls. It's a sixth life size. We have these all the way up to life size, by the way. So I'm taking the cast and trimming it. I need to do this trim and assembly to start. So I took my knife, trimmed it all out, and to assemble the cast is really pretty simple. There's only three parts. You can see I have one part where the sinus cavity is on top. Just so right there with the, over the teeth. And I'm going around the edges and in the horns. I'm putting some bonding agent inside and outside too just to soften it because I'm going to use a pressure method of assembling this. I'm going to work it in my hands, letting that paper soften up, helping it to lose the memory that's in it so I can flex it into the skull inside where those right there, the, those are really the the eyes, the bone inside the eyes that I'm pushing up to the top of the skull and I'm pressing the horns together, working it into my hands, getting that to relax. Now the other eye, I'm pushing it up with my sculpture tool to the top of that eye cavity. Now I'm forming the sides, pushing that together, working it with my hands. As I do this, the bonding agent works itself into the, the cast and softens the paper and then uh, relaxes as I go. And I get a lot of headway that way. Now I'm just using my burnisher to flatten it a little bit. I have some areas that I still need to push together and of course I'm going to have to seam it all. So I'm going to use some thin paper, a, a number three sheet here. Number two or three sheets will work fine on this small cast. Fill that hole first pick up those ready sheets with my brush and lay them where I need them on this cast to, to seam it. Burnish it in. Hit that a little too hard there and it came off. So I'm going to push it in a 
to that hole. Now I'm taking it off my burnisher and going to put it in there by hand. Still trying to get the top of that eye cavity where I want it. Till I get all that memory changed. The other one came down too. As I work this, it could come out of place, and so I continue to work it. The paper has a mind of its own, but you have to outthink it sometimes. You have to know, learn to know what it's going to do. It's not like clay. That, that's a no-brainer. Clay's dumb. Paper's smart. But uh, it doesn't take much to outsmart it. Outthink it. Now I'm going to fill in this area where I want it to look symmetrical on both sides, so I'm going to add some here to bring it up to where the other side is. Now, the skull's dry. I dried that a little bit. Now I'm going to work it some more, so I'm going to put it all in there because I'm going to get it pretty wet, and I don't want to hold it when it's wet, so I'm going to use an awl to help me hold it. And I'm going to start chasing out the top of that skull. This is a six life size and, and it's pretty simple in terms of the cast. The bigger they go in scale, the more complicated they become. I don't even have horn covers for this size, but I can make them if I want to sculpt some horn covers to go on there. So I just lay these thin sheets on and where I want them and Trying to get it symmetrical, a little bit smoother. It's a skull, so it needs to have some nuances in it. And, and uh, this size goes pretty fast. The quarter life size has horn covers, as does the rest. And uh, then we go to third life size and half life size and all the way up to life size. And that one has a lot more to it, a lot more parts. Now I'm chasing out the side. This particular skull has um, five parts, top, bottom, the, 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 um, sinus cavity and the two mastoid bones. I'm going to work around this part where the horns and the eyes are close together. That wants to get a little round in there. Skulls are fun to do, but they are challenging, and the bigger they go, the more challenging they become, because you just have more to deal with. There's my third life size. I used that as a model. I actually sculpted that in paper, and I molded it. You see it has horn covers, and I sealed that paper. So that's pretty, pretty hard. I kind of painted it like a real skull with some acrylic. Now I'm going to hard burnish this. It's dry and I'm going to work it hard with sort of a rounded burnisher. 
when I look at the skull, I want to get this area right through there. So I'm looking at that. This is an old bull. Skulls are all different, just like people, just like people's skulls. Animal skulls are different. The, uh, the young ones and the cows have smaller skulls than the bulls, of course. That's the neck hole, and I'm kind of chasing that out a little bit. Unless the skull is upside down, you really don't see this. That piece of hair or string out of my way. Now I'm going to work in these areas that have a texture. They're like a bunch of little holes right there. On the skull. I'm using a dressmaker pen to do this. Punching those holes in. I, I, I'm thinking they're probably holes where blood goes into, or it's cartilage. I'm not sure what makes that, but they all have those. And around the horns too, the horns have a lot of holes, especially where there's a ridge right there where the horn and the skull come together, and, and the skull has some holes. And again, I think it's where the blood goes through the bone or into the bone. And then the eyes have these notches. It's good to look at a buffalo skull, pictures or or a real one as far as that goes. And you can modify these casts to make them narrower. An old bull like this is, or a younger bull. Cow. Like I said, they're all a little bit different. And then they have these little holes around the eyes too. So I'm going to use my pen to put those in. Skull's taking shape pretty quick here. Doesn't take long to do one. It's a matter of working on it. Wet and dry. When it's wet, you dry it. And in minutes, you can start working on it again depending on where it's wet. Now I'm working these separations that uh, are in the skull. It's so when it goes down from the eyes to the bridge of the nose. And another one right there to define the, the nose to the skull. And there's some texture in there that I'm going to use that little burnisher that looks like a tucked hole burnisher. It's actually a dental burnisher. And then there's a little notch that's here and it goes down to the top of the mouth. And it's sort of a straight line to go where the top teeth would be if a buffalo had top front teeth, but they don't. Neither do cows. And by the way, a cow skull doesn't look like a buffalo skull. It's got a different shape, a little narrower. You could probably make one out of buffalo skull by taking a starter cast and 
altering it to look like a cow's skull if you have a cow's skull. I've always wanted to do that. I haven't done it yet, but I know I could if I wanted to. And that's what it looks like, that little line there. And then they have some holes here. I imagine there's a big artery that goes through there. I can't imagine why else that hole would be there. I've never taken any medical courses for anatomy, so I don't all know all the terms or what all the parts are for, but I know what they look like. And that looks like a buffalo skull. Now, let's go to the bow and arrows. You can see he's holding that bow in his left hand, pulling the string with his right hand, and he's got an arrow in his teeth. So what I'm going to do here is make the bow string but I need some strong paper to do that. So I'm gonna put some Elmer's glue, white glue and some water and dilute it. You can use acrylic for this too. It it's, makes a real good freeze. It's acid free and it freezes fluff. And it also makes paper harder. So, I added a little more there just to get a little thicker. Looks like milk. Now I've cut some. This these are ragboard that you can buy in your art supply store. Real thin, thirty-second of an inch for the bowstring, and sixteenth of an inch ragboard. or my rope or reins for the horse. I'm gonna make them both here. So I dip them into that pail of acrylic and water and lay it down on my drying stand. And I repeat this process with all my strings. I rarely do just one. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do enough to keep me in bow strings and horse reins and ropes for a while because that's what I'm making here. I can use my paper to do this, but I, I have a different kind of paper and it's not as stiff when it gets wet as this because this paper is got a lot of treatment to it, a lot of sizing that they manufacture when they and they press it different than I do for sculpting. I've done this with my strings but uh, I mean with my board, with my paper but I like to use this and not my paper. And I have to flip them from time to time so they don't stick to that drying stand while they're drying. Now this is a, a, a sheet of half inch foam board that I've covered with packing tape to give it a little bit of a plastic surface so nothing sticks to it. Now you can see I'm holding that 16th inch string in my fingers and I'm twisting it. I cut these on my paper cutter with my 2 cat. I'm going to tie a knot in it after I have it twisted. Just one little loop through there. 
and I'm going to use a dressmaker pen to pin one end just to hold it while I twist it. And because it has kind of a, a square to it, when I cut that flat board, sixteenth of an inch, then and I twist it, it gives the illusion of twine and sinew that's wrapped together. Now I'll tie a knot in the other end and put a pin in that. So I have it suspended there tightly. Now I'm going to take some bonding agent and just r roll that or brush that on to get it all relaxed. It's actually what happens is I, it changes the memory of the paper because the paper wants to be straight. Remember, I'm twisting it. And then I pin it at the other end so it can't unravel because it wants to go back to where it was. But it doesn't have a chance to because I'm out thinking it. I'm smarter than this paper. I'm going to pin it down there and when I put that bonding agent on there it's really giving the paper a lobotomy. It can't remember where it was. It only remember where it is now. This is a bowstring and you see it's a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch. I twisted it there and it broke a little piece. That happens a lot when I use my board. And if you use acrylic, it won't happen as easily because the acrylic has a little more plastic in it than the uh, than the glue, the Elmer's glue. But if you use enough Elmer's glue, then that might not happen. I probably needed it a little bit thicker. But, and you can see I've tied it there and put a pin in it. Now I'm twisting it. You can see the difference between this bowstring and the reins, but it looks like rope. Twisting it, holding it with my left hand, twisting it with my right, working my way up that string, just like I did with the thicker strings. Get to the end of it, tie a little knot in it, And put a pin in it and put a little pressure on it and straighten it out. You could probably use cardboard for that. Sometimes they break though and I and they and they fall down because they stretch a little bit and uh, they'll usually break around the pins just before they're dry and so I like to have a little protection there. So they don't stick to something I don't want them to stick to. And that's a bowstring. And this is the reins. And you can see the difference in thickness. Now I'm going to tear some paper. This is a number three sheet or four sheet will work. And I'm making a pattern for the bow. I'm going to show you two ways of making the bow. This is a rolled way. So I tear the paper, put a little notch in it there, and then tear it straight here. And, and it's kind of what I call a paper doll cut or tear. And you can see that it's like almost like a kite. Looks kind of like a an airplane there with wings. A little bit weird looking, but when I lay my wire on there and roll it, it's going to be thin on the two ends and thicker toward the middle and then thin right at the middle again. And bear with me, there's a method behind my madness here. 
I'm going to roll that around the wire, tuck and roll, tuck and roll with my tuck tool burnisher. I invented that tuck tool burnisher, it's a great tool. Now I'm going to roll it on the wire and I have paper rolled around a wire which I take out the wire now I'm going to flatten it out become my bow now I'm going to take it and bend it like a bow I'm going to put quite a bend into this because I want this to go on my rider and he's bending it but if I wanted it to be with going into the quiver I keep it straighter you know it's that bow string that bends the bow so I make it shaped like a bow there's a bow and then I'm going to lie it on my sculpture stand I'll use that grid to sort of make it symmetric on both sides grid helps me do that and then I can dry it there this is another way to make a bow this is uh, about a 1 8 inch sheet of hard board and I'm going to cut a strip out of this with my knife on my soft cutting board and I always cut several times I don't try to get it all the way through the first time just like cutting mat board you take your time with it I'm gonna whittle it I'm gonna use that same exacto blade number 11 blade an exacto knife to shape the bow and I'm gonna shape it sort of like I had it when I rolled it just whittling it like it's wood shaping it out now there's my bow it's straight so they're still they're not quite that straight when they go in the bow case but almost they do have a little bend to them kind of like the one in the picture there on the left which would be the unstrung bow I wet this and burnish it I don't use sandpaper to me sand is dirt and I don't want dirt on my paper so I just wet it and burnish it and that works the same way to smooth it take out the roughness in my carving real fast because the paper presses in when I do this and, and smooths and you can see it's starting to take some shape there because the paper is wet and it relaxes when when I burnish it and it's easy to bend and then it'll stay where I bend it because the bonding agent makes it lose its memory. It's that lobotomy effect like the bowstring had when I put it on it. Just burnishing this on both sides, shaping it, making it a little bit smaller and bending it, getting it the shape that I want it before I dry it and I'll do pretty much what I did with the other bow that I made I'm going to use this one I decided but I'll use the other one because it's about the same size I'll use that one later that's going to go in his hand 
still working on this rider taking the bull with the bow it's a limited edition original paper version from my molds that I use for the bronze but I'm sculpting out all the accessories rather than molding them what I'm doing here is just checking the size and the shape to get it the way I want it as if he's holding it in his hand now I, I've dried it and I want to trim it a little more get a little more thickness off here that one I rolled was a little thinner and I like that but I thought it was a little too thin a lot of times I'll roll more than one just to get the, the one that I want because it only takes a minute to do it this is maybe a little more work with the board but it sure is more fun now you can see where I've carved it and now I'm going to smooth it on this close-up and it smooths out pretty fast and you can do this with a rolled bow too if you if it's not quite the shape you want it and you want to add more or take more off you can do it with our paper. I'm going to add a little padding to the handle here, a little some strips paper, semi-hard paper or hard paper will work too. It's kind of like sinew where the handle of that bow would be. I try to make them the way the Indians made them. If I make them like them then it's actual detail as opposed to sculpting in the detail with sculpture tools so I'm going to form it around here make it a little bit fatter suppose I wouldn't have had to carve it in that way but that's what I like to do because I want to get it the right thickness at, from the time that I carve it to time that I wrap it like this and this is just a little leather sheet thin, thinner leather sheet strip so I cut wet it and wrap it around and it bonds it looks like a leather wrap because it's a leather wrap now I'm going to cut some fringe for the top and bottom around that handle so I tape a strip of thin leather paper to a strip of mat board with some masking tape the mat board stops my scissors and allows the fringes to hang to that strip inside under the tape and there's my fringe just like a piece of leather fringe that was cut out of leather I'm, it's a little little wide there so I'm going to cut some off the bottom and then fold it in half because I need two so I'm just going to tear it now this is where it's going to go at the top and the bottom of that handle just like that so 
No. I'm going to wrap some sinew around just above that so the fringe will overlap. This is called a sinew back bow. It makes the bow stronger. Now, I've got the top one done. I'm going to do the bottom one now. I just kind of wet that strip where the fringe isn't, where it's connected to, and wet the bow right there below the wrap handle. And then I take a string, paper string, and wrap around that to hold it all in place. Kind of like what I'm doing here that you can't see. Now I'm going to show it to you. Right there. It's just a little string that I cut on my 2P cat. My 2P cat precision paper cutting assist tool. It's an acronym. Now I'm going to cut a notch on the end of the bow where the bow string is going to go couple different ways they did this. I like this way. It's just a little just a little notch. I'm going to do that on both sides. Clean up my wraps there a little bit. I'm going to carve this in, make it a little more narrow. Now there's my bow string. I'm going to make a loop around it and take another little string that I cut. I'll wet this with some thicker bonding agent right there at the base of the loop and wrap my little cut paper string out of my hard paper, just like hair paper, around that. Now there's my loop. It'll go on that notch like that. And the other side, I attach it and wrap that because it's always wrapped on one end and then looped over that notch on the other. There's a notch on both ends and then wrapped on that one end. Now we're going to make some arrows. These are little wire that I'm going to wrap paper on. Six or seven of them. I'm going to make six or seven arrows because he's got one in his bow, one in his mouth, and then a bunch of them in his quiver. So I'm going to tear some thin paper. This is a number two sheet. And I want it to be a little bit narrower than the wire, not quite, or a little shorter than the wire, I'll put it that way. Out of my blue container, I always have my thicker bonding agent that I've mixed. It's not real thick, this is kind of medium thick. And I'll lay it down on my strip, and then, just like the bow, tuck and roll. Roll it over the wire, tuck it under the wire. That's why I call it a tuck tool burnisher because it's got this tuck in and then the tool end on both sides. That's actually my dental tool that I'm using but I use my tuck tool burnisher too. They got pretty much the same tuck into them. little loose end here and I'm going to burnish that. I've got to do this well, I think seven times I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to check the length. I want it to be a little bit longer so I can cut it. It's going to go between his fingers and just past this 
finger on his left hand, the index finger, the guide finger. Now I'm going to roll another one. Little brass wires. Got an hardware store. We we offer these too as tools. I uh, will have a whole package of them. Different sizes. Now I'm going to dry all these that I've rolled. Now they're dry. So I want to burnish them, get them a little smoother. Now I'm going to cut them to the length that I want. Cut both ends. On two of them I'm going to put a uh, steel tip. Trade tip. I'm going to notch one end where the bowstring is going to go and kind of round the other end where the arrow head is going to go that steel tip trade arrow head there's a notched end Just you notch it put a little slice in the back of it I have the wire pressed down inside so I don't dull my knife. Back it off here a little bit so you can see it. It was a little out of focus. Sorry for that. But you can see I'm notching it there a little bit better. I probably should have taken that clip out. There you can see where the bow string is going to go. Arrows have that. That's hard paper. Thick hard paper sheet that I've kind of cut the shape of a trade steel tip arrowhead. The white men traded with the Indians. They gave them beads and the Indians gave them things that were a lot more valuable like beaver pelts and I put that arrowhead on the end of the shaft and now I'm going to now wrap that with some sinew which is my hard pa hair paper that I cut on my toupee cap Now, I'm going to put another one right here that would hold the feathers. Doesn't really, but it looks like it does. That's details on a real arrow that the Indians made. And you can see I've wrapped it there. It's very fine detail. Now I'm going to cut a strip here very thin strip. This is going to be my feather end. And I'm going to attach it like I did to friends to a piece of board, mat board, just to stop my scissors. And I'm going to tape it down with some masking tape to temporarily just to hold it while I cut it. And I'm going to cut it on an angle, that strip. That's what arrows are. I mean, that's what the Indians did. They took a feather and they split it at the spine. And they used the uh, feather end as a guide, sort of a fin, like on a rocket. Now I'll cut those the length that I want them. And there are three all the same size. Now with my thicker bonding agent I'm going to wet the shaft of the arrow, pick up a feather piece and lay it 
right in on that bonding agent and it'll fuse in. Sometimes they want to turn a little bit and you have to help them get back to where you want them. They'll, they'll get hydrated and but actually feathers do that too. Now I'm going to wrap this in. It's like that, that sinew goes over the spine that would be exposed after they take some of the feather end off of it to, to wrap it. That's how an arrow is made. Actual arrow. Actual detail. It just looks like a real arrow. It's kind of kind of cool now. I'm making sure it stays where I want it and I'm going to pull the wire out a little bit to stick it in my drying stand to dry it. Now I'm going to go back and I've done all these and I'm going to trim that feather in. You can see I didn't put arrow heads on most of these because they're going to go in the quiver. You'll never know they're not there. I'm going to take some thick bonding agent and sort of fuse them all together here. And I don't worry about those feathers. They they get all um, bent up when they're in, in a quiver anyway. When they touch each other and you pull them out and they straighten out because every feather has a little hair coming from the spine and that hair has a memory and it wants to come out. If it's crimped or you can help it with your fingers. If you ever played with a feather, you know that. They have kind of like, oh, a little hook and loop, like Velcro, between each of those hairs on the feather. So I'm going to get them all fused together and dry that. And those are the arrows that will go in my quiver. Now, Let's make some feathers. So I'm cutting, cutting a wider strip. The width that I want my feathers to be in this scale. And the length that I want them to be. So I'm going to make two that are about the same here. These will be the head feathers that goes on the head of my hunter. Now I'm going to take my tuck tool burnisher and with uh, a clear straight edge I'm going to score it and fold it right in the middle of both of those strips. Now I'm going to do again what I call a paper doll cut. So I'm going to cut on an angle at one end, and then I'm going to do another cut, but this one's not going to go all the way through. And the other end I'm going to round, sort of round point at the tip, and go in to that second cut. It looks like sort of a, a bomb with the fins going the wrong way. I have to practice that. I used to have templates when I first started doing this, but now I just do it. Done enough feathers to feather several eagles, I think. These are golden eagle feathers, by the way, that they wore on the plains. Now I have two of those. Now I'm going to take my tuck tool burnisher and I'm going to score the hairs that come out from the spine on an angle. Just like if I cut this in half after I had the spine on there, I could put that on my arrows. If I want to trim down that spine a little bit. Now you can see the, the scores I have in that. I'm going to cut along those little lines, create some actual detail. It's 
Some people have accused me of using actual feathers, but I don't. I leave that up to God. I make mine out of paper. Little thick bonding agent there. I've cut a strip, kind of a, like a long triangle out of some hard, thick, thicker paper. And I'm putting the wider end at the bottom using my tweezers to sort of get it right along that crease. Work it in with my finger, making sure it stays where I want it. And that's the top spine, and I'll have to do that on the bottom as well. Again, some thicker paper, a long, thin triangle. See, it's thicker at the bottom, kind of goes to a point. And I lay it in where I want it. Put some bonding agent on the back. Sometimes I, I'll do several of these and I'll, I'll do all the fronts, let it dry, and then I'll do the backs. But if I only have a couple, I just might do it this way. You just got to be a little more careful because everything's wet. Push it into that crease in the back. And that's my second one. Now I'll dry those. Now I'm going to make some smaller feathers. Now I'm, I'm, I'm taking that strip and I'm just going to crease the whole thing and then I fold it and then I'll cut that the length that I want each feather. These are little ones that will go on the bow and on the on the reins of the horse and also on the sharps carbine just to decorate them and there's my little feathers now I'm going to cut my big ones so I'm going to go on the back end where that thin shape is and I'm going to cut it real thin there so it kind of curls going to create kind of a downy the feathers get really kind of wild toward they get toward the skin of the bird where the down is and then they tend to be a little more ruly as they go up the feather but they're really really feathery at the bottom just to keep that bird a little warmer and I'll go down both sides cutting where I scored it that detail and I gotta be careful I don't want to cut that spine in half and I don't cut even cuts I cut in part way and doesn't looks like I'm cutting in the same to that spine all the way but I don't if I did I would create a ridge there and I don't want to create a ridge so so I cut them different. I cut them in different, except for right down here. I'll cut them in the same there because I'll cut them in all the way. And you can do that. Patty often cuts hers in all the way to the spine. I don't know how she does that without marking up the spine. Sometimes I do hit that spine, and I'll take my burnisher and smooth it out. You can see how I've done it at this close up here. I don't know. To me, it looks like a feather. Little feather, but it's a feather just the same. Now I'll burnish the front. Now I'll do the same with these little feathers. I've put the spines on them. I've scored them. Now I'm going to cut those. And there's all my little feathers. I've got more than I need. But I wanted different size ones just in case I want to use smaller ones in different places. So I'm going to wet 
that little downy end, that feathery end, and stick them together. Now, I've rolled some thin paper on a wire, and I want to create wraps for the head feathers anyway. So I've measured the wrap with these dividers, and I'm going to need two, but I'm going to measure out more than two. And I've taped both ends over the wire just to keep everything on the wire. And I'm cutting right through with a, with a blade to the wire and rolling it in my fingers so I'm cutting around it to create little little tubes. When I slide those off of there it'll be hollow where the wire is. But I'm, I've got some strings there that I'm ready to use because they use felt or cloth to wrap around the quill of the feather I'm doing one more here. So then I have four of these. But I'm only going to use two of them because on this I'll use two more on another project. Now I'm going to wet all those little four little cylinders that are cut away from each other. And I'm going to make three wraps around each cut in. One, two, three. I'm going to bring it up to the middle, make a few more wraps, and bring it up to the end, and three more around there. That's the way I do it. I've seen uh, wraps done this way. I've seen them done all the way. And sometimes I'll do that. I'll just wrap it kind of like a candy cane but this way I get a little more um, anatomy to that wrap so it's just the way I do it it's my style and I've seen Indians do it with a certain style I have my own now I'm going to cut some leather strips that are real thin these are going to be the loops now I've dried my wraps on the wire and I'm going to take the tape off that holds everything on and slide them off and break them away from each other because they're that little string that I put on there worth holding them still. Sometimes I'll cut it with scissors. Now I'm going to take those leather strips that I've cut real short and make a little loop, wet one end, and stick the wrap onto that. Now that's a loop. Now I'm going to take the quill end of my feather that I cut, cut to sort of a point and I'm going to slide it in. Now I've got a wrapped feather. And I'm going to do that same exercise with the second feather. And I usually make the, the loops going this up and down so they're opposite to that spine. You can see that there. There's some thicker paper. And I'm going to make an abalone disc for the head feathers. I'm going to cut that. It's about, oh, a sixteenth of an inch board. And I take the disc, wet it. And then I take a burnisher. Actually, this is rounder burnisher. And I'm going to make it sort of 
concave like an abalone disc would be. Now I'm going to dry it and then after I've dried it, I'm going to punch four holes in it. I'm going to wet it again. And just kind of burnish it a little bit where I cut it out. Take away the lamination marks. It's actually a, a couple of leather strips that I laminated together because it had, gives me texture like an abalone. Now I put a, a, a another string piece of uh, leather through the loops because those feathers were sort of stuck together and I'm going to run that through the, one of the holes on my abalone disc and those are my that's my head feathers. So how did Plains Indians get abalone? Abalone is a sea shell. If they couldn't find it out on the prairie from ancient times like a fossil, which they were hard to find, they traded for them from the Indians in the west. Now I've attached some little loops around these small feathers, dried it, and now I'm going to wet these loops. And I'm just going to wrap these together with some string rather than wrapping them individually with wraps. I'm going to do it this way. Real thin hair paper. create that actual detail and then I'm going to dry those now I'm going to take a piece of plastic and I'm putting some thin bonding agent on that plastic and this is fluff that I made by taping some four or five soft sheet down on a board and rubbing it across it with my blade like I used to cut out or cut around my wraps and I'll take this fluff and I'll lay it on these little dots of bonding agent that will hold it. Now I'm taking that spray. It's the same spray that I use to freeze the bowstring just in a spray bottle. And that's going to freeze that fluff. Now we're going to make the Sharps carbine. And this is a drawing I have of the Sharps carving on the top there and the bottom part was an actual photograph of one of my ones that I've done previously. And I'll tape that down on a thick piece of board and I'm going to trace out the stock and the grip in the front and cut it out with my scroll saw. It was a little thick, but I wanted to show you, I could have grabbed the right thickness, but I wanted to show you how, how you can split this paper and carve on it. So I've laid that pattern down that I cut out and I'm splitting it along where it was laminated together. And now I'm going to sort of shape that with my knife smooth it just traced it out on board from my drawing with a carbon sheet cut it out with my scroll saw and now I'm going to 
whittle it down like it was on a lathe. That's what they do with rifle stocks. They cut them on a lathe. I've done all kinds of rifles. M1 Grands, M16s like we had in Nam. Um, numerous Civil War muskets and um, other kinds of black powder rifles. And this is the Sharps. I like the Sharps because it's really complicated. This is a replica. It's not a bad replica, but it's not a great one either. But I want to show you the detail that I'm going to create. You can see it. It sort of takes uh, a mechanical action to drop that breech block down with the trigger guard. And that's the groove where the cartridges go. It's a cartridge rifle. A carbine. It's rifled, which means it has lands and grooves in the barrel. This hinged part back here has a near the stock has a place to to put cartridges or whatever they want, cleaning tools. Now I'm sanding this. Of course, I'm not sanding it. I'm wetting it and burnishing it. But I'm smoothing the uh, the stock that I carved out. Shaping it to the same shape as the sharps. That's looking pretty good. But I've got a little more to do with it. Because this is just the wooden and some metal parts that would come out later. This is the hammer that I'm tracing out. And I'm doing the same thing as I did with the stock. And I cut that out on my, that's it right there. Cut the hammer out on my scroll saw too. And I cut it out thicker than it needed to be because it has a, a shape that I need to get where the hammer overlaps to the inside to strike the pin. And I'm sure of cutting out the metal part you, that, that are in the top there. That's the breech block where the push my brush handle in there to show you where cartridges go. But it's, there's a groove there. So I've got to make that groove. Cut it out with my knife and use a round tool to get the groove after I've wet it. And these are the little mechanisms that they're little channels, guides that work for that breech block to come down. And they're covered, they're, they're, they, they actually have a, a wider panel on the outside. I sort of cut it on the inside where there's that mechanism is and I'm going to cover it there with that panel. Now I'm going to add the hammer and that's sort of what it looks like on the bottom of that replica that I showed you you want to go back and look at it. It's always good to have replicas and, or the real thing. But if you don't, use pictures. Try to get it right. Put in some of the metal parts on top where the hammer strikes. 
And here I've got to cut a groove for the barrel in the front grip, which was wood. I've rolled paper over a sixteenth inch wire that will be the barrel and I'll cut that the length that I need it and lay it in that groove the front grip. Now I'm using my picture to get the right length. Picture is the scale and there's my wire and I'm going to leave that wire in there just to make it stronger but I have to cut it with my needle nose. I'll cut a little bit shorter than the barrel is. Jam it up in there and put a little paper in the end jam the paper in. I, I do that because then it can't warp when I when I wet everything to put it in that groove at the front grip. And there's a little piece of paper that I'm pushing in to hold the wire in and to create the hole where the bullets come out. Now I'm going to chase around that front grip, get that where I, the way I want it, and that'll also hold the barrel. Now there's a little lever there that I've put in and I'm cutting a piece of that round rolled paper to fit there where there's a hinge for that trigger guard mechanism that drops down and that kind of fits up against that, that lever. Lever is part of that hinge so it can break apart. I'm going to bend the trigger guard with this is some thicker board. Actually it's not real thick board. You can see that but I wet it and bent it with my tweezers and dried that. And I'm working on these metal parts now using my knife cutting in where the trigger goes open it up a little bit so I can put my trigger that I cut in there. Wet front and back. Now I'm going to take my trigger guard and lay that where I want it. And another part that goes behind that. Just working on the detail on this Sharps carbine. When it's all done it's going to be Sharps carbine. Now I'm going to work on the sights and cutting paper the shapes that I need them to be to sculpt those sights in. Those are the back sights and I put the front sight on. Now this little hinged plate back there and I'll take a little strip put it in there that makes up the hinge. And there's my Sharps carbine but it's not decorated yet so it needs brass tacks. And it needs these little nails that go uh, in front of this hinge on that little decorated element. I'm taking some uh, board, punching it with my leather punch. These are going to be brass tacks. And this part is where the ring goes. They have a ring on one side so the cavalry guys can uh, 
put it on a belt on sort of a clip. And that's where we're going with this with the brass tacks. That was a photograph of one. I've done a lot of these, an earlier one. I have a limited edition on these. And I do them different sizes. I've done them all the way up to life size. Now I'm going to put those brass tacks in. And decorate it the way I want it. I punched a lot of those. And there's my Sharps carbine. I'm going to put a butt plate in the back of it, which would be metal. And I'm just going to cut a strip that's wider than the butt. And then I'm going to cut another strip here. And this is going to be it's going to look like a spring when I'm done. I'm going to tape one end. I've wet it. And then I'm going to wind it around the wire. This is a fairly thick wire. These are going to be my rings. I got a lot more. I can use those as earrings on some of my sculptures. Butt plate's dry, so I'm just going to carve around that stock to create the illusion of a butt plate on there. And I'll burnish that. Smooth it in. It covers up the lamination and it also makes makes it look like a butt plate because it's a plate. Now I'm going to attach the feathers where the uh, the ring would be on the front grip that also holds the barrel. They would probably take that off of there and use it for something else. The Indians did that kind of thing. They had lots better use for metal than we know. Make a knife out of it or some, some other kind of tool because they can fasten that barrel onto that grip with sinew when they do this decoration. And I'm going to put a strap. This is a str leather strip because he's got this carbine on a strap that hangs below his quiver and bow case so he can kill a wounded animal if he needs to because that only has one shot in it but it's pretty lethal and he doesn't want to approach a wounded animal with a bow and arrow but he's going to take the bull with the bow not the carbine and there's my strap and all I have left to do on this is put the ring on. I'm going to bend. This is sort of a, like a wire that they have. And then they'll put a ring inside that wire. And they'll clip the metal part of their strap, the cavalry guys do, to that ring. Indians would probably take it off of there. but. For some reason, this warrior wants to leave it on. He thinks it's cool. And maybe he has another reason for it. Or maybe I'm just showing off. I don't know, but I'm, I'm putting it on there. I'll take that ring. I just cut, cut those in that spring in half and I got a bunch of rings, that paper spring that I took off my wire. And I'm putting it in place there. Now I'm going to put my fluff on my feathers. 
it's dry. Put a little bonding agent there on, on my feather and then put my fluff on the feathers. And my shark's carbine is pretty much done. Pretty much. Might want to do a, one or two more things to it, but pretty much done. Now I've taken this leather sheet and I'm going to make the sheath for the knife. Since I've done this a few times before, and I have some sketches, I've just taken some quick measurements and I kind of sketched out a little bit of shape that I'm going to cut around for this. It's a typical Plains Indian knife sheath. They have different designs and you'll see the one that I'm creating here. You can see I've kind of scored it and I'm cutting around it that score. I mean I'm cutting around the score with my scissors. And that's the knife. It's leather sh sheet of paper. A knife sheath, I mean. Now, what they usually do is put a, a piece of rawhide or thick leather on the back side of that. So I'm going to sketch out using the knife sheet that I cut out. I'm going to use that as a template to cut another shape that's going to go in behind the knife. And that piece of leather is about as thick as the knife blade so they can get the knife out of the sheath. Now, right here is where that goes. And I could use my bonding agent to fuse that in together. This is uh, some thin board, about 32nd of an inch board that I'm going to use and I'm cutting this to create the knife blade that will go in the sheath. Now this will never come out but I I do create these so they can, so I'm going to show you this, how I do it. And there's a knife blade. Now usually there's a little part that sticks out on the end that will go into the handle of the knife, so I've done that. And I've taken a, a round dowel piece of paper that I rolled. And I'm creating kind of a, a horned, like a spiked buck, a young buck that just has little spikes. And I'm sculpting that into this round dowel paper that I rolled on wire. And I'm sort of just kind of creating that. I, I like to make these, they look like like the little antlers on a, a young buck, a spike buck. So I'm carving the shape of that with my knife, my exacto knife. Getting it the shape and the size that I want it. Kind of open it up there with a sculpture tool and rounding it off. 
See, I have a hole so I can put the, the blade in, in in that little hole. That's, of course, why I rolled it on the wire. I'll open it up a little bit with my dental burnisher, tucked old burnisher if it's handy. And I'll put the blade in. That's my knife. Now I'm going to carve in a little bit of detail here, sculpt it in with my sculpture tool to create the antler effect. Now I'm going to open that up a little bit. That sheath so I can put the knife in it. No one will ever know that that's a whole knife in there because it's never going to come out. It's fused in there now. I'm going to take my leather punch and, and get some more brass tacks like I put on the Sharps carbine on that tool. Now that the knife sheath is done and the knife, I'm going to work on the quiver and bow case. So I'm taking a leather sheet and I'm cutting that. And I'll use this for both the quiver and the bow case. Take off this uneven edge here and lay down a piece of mat board to make a stop for my scissors when I cut the fringe. Tape it on and just cut it with my scissors. I'll do this at the top and the bottom of my quiver. Moving it to the bottom now. Tape it in position and I'll cut that. That map will stop my scissors and give me an even place to stop across top of those cuts. Now I got fringe on both sides, long fringe at the top, short fringe at the bottom. And you can see it's got a leather grain in it. That's kind of nice. People see that and they they like it. Now I'm going to score across just under that top, the, long, the longer fringe, fold that over, and then I'm going to wet, this would be the inside of the quiver, and I'm also going to wet the outside. I can use water for this, it'll soak in. soften up a little bit, move my fringe out of the way because it'll stick to it if I don't. Now I'm laying in a, a brass tube that will give me something to, um, something as a form to shape this quiver with because it's, it's going to have arrows in it. I'll just work it. Try to get it to lose a little memory. Put a little bonding agent inside there. And then I'm going to press it together with my fingers. Lay it down and burnish it a little bit. Get that to bond a little better. Now, the quiver is kind of tunnel shaped. Narrow at the bottom and wider at the top. I got a 
really work this at the top because it's folded there and it, it, it's giving me a hard time. It's got to lose twice its memory. Anyway, I'm going to cut this on an angle to make it narrower on the bottom and wider at the top. And now it's shaped like a quiver. I'm still working it. I don't want that fringe to stick there. It's wet. So I want to take my burnisher and, and pull that out. Actually, that fringe should be laying down anyway because of the way it's hanging. It, gravity would pull it down. And gravity pulls this fringe down too, so I'm going to lay that down. Try to get some of these crimps out. Bow cases could be made out of rawhide or leather. This is more of a leather one. So now let's start on the the bow case. Basically I'm going to do what I did with the quiver. I'm going to fringe it on the top and the bottom. Only this time the fringe at the top is going to be shorter. I'll cut that and then fold it in half. I've got fringe at the top. Now I'm going to cut the shape that I want for this bow case. I'll start it from here. And it kind of gets a little fatter in the middle. I'll actually bow it out. Imagine that, the bow case is bowed. Now, I'll cut the fringe at the bottom. And it's going to be a little longer. The reason it's shorter at the top is because they have to get their arrows out of the top. I'm going to use this first bow that I made as a measurement make sure since both of them are the same size I use this one to stretch it out like it would be if it were unstrung and that gives me the size that uh, I need my bow case to be the end needs to be hanging out a little bit on the bow case and the hunter will grab his bow with those feather tassels at the end and pull it out of his bow case, especially if he needs to get out in a hurry. And he just may. Lots of things going on on the prairie. So I'm going to wet the inside of his bow case and the outside. Soften it a little bit so I can shape it so it looks like a bow can fit in there. Sort of bow it out here, bend it. Now it looks like there could be a place to put a bow in. And I'm going to fit the quiver and the bow case together where it would be stitched together. And there'll be a stick in there too that I'll show. I've made these different ways. I'm going to make it so the stick shows, but um, kind of use my burnisher to press it in almost like stitches but I'll actually stitch it that holds it together when I do that now I'll dry this now I'm going to cut a strap for it but I want fringe at both ends and I'm actually going to cut through this 
and run the strap through. And stitch it in later. I don't want these holes in there to run the strap through. Open it up with my burnisher so I can put the strap through there. Work both sides in. Now I've got the strap in one side and I'll put it in the other side. So the strap is actually going to be fastened on and decorative ends with the fringes come and overlap the bow case. And I'll put a little bonding in, agent in there and, and I'll wet it and fasten them down and give them a little twist. Now this is a stick. Actually I rolled paper and wire to create a stick but it needs to be as long as the quiver and that will be fused on there. The purpose for that is to keep the bow case from crimping up when the bow is pulled out of it. So I'll stick that on. Now I'm going to wet the quiver. It's gotten a little flat, so I'm going to soften it up a little bit and put a tool in there and round it out. I need room for my arrows. That's what a quiver is for, is to hold arrows. Now I'm cutting a, a leather sheet. It's sort of like a piece of rawhide that would go on the bottom of the of the quiver to keep the arrows from coming out, but it also um, needs to be hard because the arrows cut. Dry that. Now I'm going to punch holes all the way down. Then I'm going to use some of my leather strips to sort of stitch this all together through those holes over the stick. Hold that in place. Push it through there. And I'm going to stitch this all the way from top to bottom. Gives it kind of an authentic look. And that's the bottom of the bow case there. And I'll, after I go down vertically, I go to go across horizontally and I'm going to do that right here and I have it all stitched up I'll make a loop there and bring it through the stitch and and that'll hold it all together and that's what they look like and these are all my arrows that will go in that quiver so I'll wet that with bonding agent and stick it in. And that's my quiver and bow case with arrows in it. Now I'm going to use some beads to decorate it. This is a buffalo uh, bead design. Actually, it's two bulls kind of in the rut going at each other, which is what I chose for this because it's a buffalo hunt and I'm going to tear those beads out and then lay it on top. They're t torn out kind of fat so I don't wreck the beads but then I can burnish that paper in that outlines those beads and looks like it's sewn onto that quiver. 
and I lay my fringe down again so it looks natural now I'm going to cut some more beads out these are round beads it's a medicine wheel I'll put that up there medicine wheel is basically a a circle with a cross in the middle or an X or what, however you want to put it it's sort of north, south, east, west and here's some more beads that I'm going to put in and this will go around the bottom of the quiver sort of, sort of covering where the stitches would be where that piece of rawhide is at the bottom. I'll wet that, let it soak in a little bit, get it soft. Not too soft though, because I don't want to wreck my beads. And I use sort of my thicker bonding agent to do that, and I wrap it around my quiver. And I've got it decorated now with with the glass beads Italian beads wherever or whoever makes those the Italians I know made them now I'm going to wet it here let it soak in because I want that bow case also because because it's soft leather it needs to fold down too naturally when the bow's not in there and actually fold over that quiver and beside the quiver at the bottom so I gingerly do that letting working it letting it so again, now I'm going to put a belt on my rider where I'm going to put the knife. Actually, I, I sort of finished these miniatures. Now I'm showing you how I used them as accessories, putting them on this rider, the hunter. And that's uh, his belt. And they usually have four holes on each side of that belt. And they run rawhide or leather through there and tie, tie the top and the bottom. So there's, I put two bows there. And I'm going to stick the knife sheath and knife down on that belt. Now I'm going to sling the carbine over his shoulder too and the quiver and bow case over the carbine. I broke the strap and then I'll fuse it on the top put it where I want. I made the straps a little bit long and I've got it where I want it and I'll just chase it in and there's my strung bow and I'm going to put that now in my finished rider's hand and the string of the bow is going in there too And the arrow in the right hand, the feathered end, and to the finger of the left hand that guides it. So I need to wet both the right hand fingers that hold the arrow and the left hand under the index finger that guides the arrow 
and that bonding agent will just hold that arrow in place naturally with the arrow there too. Now he's aiming the arrow. And I put the head feathers on and I forgot a little bit of detail on my sharps on the hammer there's a screw so I'm going to put a little slot in it put a little fluff on the feathers on the top there's my fluff and now we're all finished with accessories and miniatures The Ekman method is not paper mache and the techniques cannot be duplicated with other store-bought papers, glues, or bonding agents. We developed this medium over time by formulating our acid-free handmade paper and bonding agent together and there is no substitute.